It's Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, that it holds fast and true, that it is trustworthy and good. Pray that you will speak through Ryan today, that his words will fall away, and that your word will rule and reign in our hearts and minds. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You're going to be seated. Good morning. Hey, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, man, it's a week early for Advent. And here, so here's what was going through my mind this week. I was thinking, you know, you guys get to set your Christmas decorations up earlier than I think you should, so why can't I start Advent a week early, right? Because there's really two types of people. There are people that set up their Christmas decorations in October, and then there are people that take them down in February, and then there's maybe some of us in the middle of that. I'm not going to do a survey here because I don't want judgment to be cast across the, the aisle, but... Um, Advent, it's this, um, it's this Latin word, right? A uh, word that we sometimes use where we get the word adventure from. It means uh, arrival or coming. And we typically associate this word with Christmas. And in fact, I think Christmas uh, has almost <laughs> lost its meaning to some degree. And so I, I like the word Advent because it, it really recovers the birth of Christ from the consumeristic underpinnings that we associate Christ's birth with today. And um, what I want to do today is I want to, um, I want to set up our series. What we're going to be doing over the next several weeks, or really through the end of the year, is looking at all of the ways um, and, and a lot of relationships where light has come into, into uh, people's lives, individuals' lives, families' lives, uh, city, the life of cities uh, after a season of darkness. Um, and it is the story of the church. Uh, so we're exploring this, this theme of light and darkness. And um, in the 16th century, um, the church had been in motion for well over, uh, you know, 1,500 years, but it had become darkened. Um, hence the dark ages, right? The dark ages were the season, uh, really, of the world uh, after the Roman Empire, when, when things got dark, um, I mean, there's, 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 there's not as many uh, records of history from that season. It was just dark, pervasive darkness covered the face of the world, and it uh, definitely hit the church as well. To put it bluntly, I think you could characterize the church in that season as being asleep in the light. And, um, and what I mean by that is that God's transformative word wasn't transforming people uh, the way that the Spirit has intended for it uh, to do so. Um, so, so from this, there was this great period of reformation that started, one of the places it started was in this little city in Switzerland called Geneva. And there was such a pervasive awakening in that city, guys, that they were even minting their coins with what was happening in the church. Like it was everywhere. And the phrase that they used to describe that season of the church was post tenebras lux, another Latin word. And what it means is this. After darkness, light. I think it is what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah chapter 9, that we would not just experience Advent as this past tense kind of thing. Oh, when Jesus came and he made all things new, but then we kind of live our dead orthodoxy from there. 
But I think Advent is supposed to be past tense, present tense, and future tense in the life of believers. In the past tense sense, Jesus has come. He has justified us. He has redeemed us. In the present tense, Jesus is with us through his spirit, and he is sanctifying us as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And in a future tense, he will glorify us, and we will get restored bodies, and we will be with him forever. Amen. Isn't that what we long for? But we're not there yet. So what does it mean now for the church to live in the light after darkness? What does that mean for us? I propose that um, what it means for us is that we might embrace a lifestyle of Advent. So here's our big idea today, and it's really my sole ambition and aim uh, as we look at God's Word today, but um, that an Advent lifestyle uh, involves, uh, is exposing the work of darkness by choosing to embrace the light of knowing Christ. Um, so here's where I'm going to go today. It's a little bit more of a topical sermon, but really I'm going to bookend it with Isaiah 9. Um, and Isaiah 9 is really the theme of the entire series. But here's where I want to go. I want to look at what is Advent, to look at the original Advent, the arrival of, of Jesus that ushered in a new way for believers to live. The second thing is this, is that there is a great threat to the Advent lifestyle. And I want to explore that. I want to look at that uh, in Romans chapter 1. And, and then the third thing is this, is what's the great hope of the Advent of Jesus? Um, and I think it's a providential comfort through experiencing Christ's rule and reign in our hearts. So that's where we're going today. So let's dig into that. Let's look at Advent as lifestyle. The arrival of Jesus has ushered in a new way to live. I think the main thing that we have to realize about Jesus' ministry uh, is that it is the source of Advent, that um, he is the source of light in our darkened world. He is the source of life in our darkened hearts. He is everything. God has never really fu uh, fully removed his light from sinful humanity, even though we've sinned. There's this... There's this uh, common grace that God has given to, to all the world, even, even the unredeemed world that rejects him, God has still given a measure of grace to. I mean, even in the garden, think about this. After Adam and Eve rebelled and they, they turned their face from God, they turned their hearts from God, God still clothed them with this innocent blood, this animal, right? He still cared for them. Um, and and a, a, a even, even as this season of darkness, really, I think we could describe the, the old, Older Testament like this, is that uh, it was really a season of darkness in the life of God's people that had beams of light kind of shining through and glimmering and glistening through at different moments. But when Jesus arrives on the scene, it is full-blown light exposing the sin of the world. Now, Isaiah 9 is probably one of the most prominent places this promise of light is found. And I find it interesting that when Jesus comes on the scene, you know, last week we talked about his temptation, right? We talked about how the first thing that Jesus came to do after he, had, after he was baptized and entered public ministries, he came to deal with temptation. The second thing that he does is identify him, himself as the king of this light. Listen to Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17, where he himself identifies uh, himself as the one that, um, that Isaiah was speaking about. Here's what the word says. Now, when, when he had heard that John had been arrested, in other words, John, his cousin, was the last prophet um, in the scriptures, right? He was the, he was the last prophet before Jesus came. Um, and uh, what happened is that he withdrew into Galilee. And he left Nazareth and he went to live in Capernaum by the sea. This is in northern Israel. Um, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, these are sons of Jacob, right? These are uh, two of the 12 tribes, and, and where, um, where they were located was in the northern part of Israel, and they bordered all of these Gentile nations. So all that's significant. And then he says he did this, he, moved, he went there because, um, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Jesus was interested in connecting the dots, right, for us, to give us hope and to give us uh, confidence in his word. And so, um, uh, the, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way, of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of, of the Gentiles. The people, and, he's, and he quotes this, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And, and for those dwelling in the region 
and shadow of death on them, light has dawned. And from, the time, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, so Jesus goes to the exact place that Isaiah talks about, and he identifies himself as the light. Advent has arrived, therefore repentance must occur. Anytime light shines in our hearts, we must be aligned with the light, a lifestyle of light. Jesus says this is a lifestyle of repentance, aligning ourselves to this kingdom of light. And Jesus would make it clear in his ministry that, that repentance has to occur for us to be aligned with this lifestyle of Advent, this lifestyle of light. He'll say this in John chapter 8. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. For Jesus, light is an identity. It's not something that you, that you kind of flip on and you flip off like we think about light, but it is, it is an identity. It is a new way of living, and it is an identity for us too. As Christians, our most basic identity is this, children of light. Listen to how Paul writes it in 1 Thessalonians 5.5. 5. He says, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. Our most basic identity, church, is that we are children of the light. It doesn't feel that way sometimes, does it? The darkness has defined many of us for so long that, that wearing the light seems a little awkward. It's almost like, you know, a suit, a jacket that's, you know, a little small or some pants that are a little big, if that ever happens for you. It doesn't happen for me too often, but, you know, it just doesn't fit right because we've walked in the darkness so long. But Jesus has given this identity that as we are sanctified and as we follow him becomes really our behavior. Our behaviors follow that identity. He's come and he's done the work to make us children of the light. Now, I know what you're thinking. Like, when you think about things being exposed, that's usually like a really bad thing for us, right? We think of that negatively. Light seems intrusive, doesn't it? Friend, you need to know that if you have called Jesus your king, you're a child of the light. There's nothing that can separate you from that title except choosing to remain in the darkness with your life. Our nature is darkness, but a relationship with Jesus is now at work to turn that darkness into light. After all, what, you know, when you think about the definition of darkness, what is it? It's the absence of light. It's the absence of light. We were made to be children of light. You know what the word, the Greek word for church is? It's this word, ekklesia, and it literally means called out ones. Children of the light. That is who we are. We have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light to shine in this world. So my question for you as we kind of keep going today is this. Is what would it mean for you to functionally embrace your identity as a child of the light? What would it mean for you? What, what would it look like for you? I, it's a funny story. Um, the funny story for me is uh, I had a friend of mine take me to a great baseball game recently, and, uh, and uh, we, um, he's actually in the room today. I'm not going to look at him, though. Um, <clears throat> and we, because uh, it's kind of embarrassing, we're kind of letting you into our personal life here, but um, we had these great seats. We're going to this game, and uh, we're driving down there, and we're trying to figure out parking, and it just so turns out to be it's a really big baseball game, and tickets are, are the... Um, the uh, uh, parking spot is $180. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me for this baseball. So anyway, I text another friend, and he's like, hey, man, I've got a friend. I've got a friend that can let you use his parking spot in his apartment. It's really close to the stadium. And so uh, I said, okay. And so I start texting this other guy, and we're on the way down there. Uh, and, uh, and the guy said, okay, so here's the deal. Here's all you have to do. You just have to, when you get to the security attendant, you just have to tell him you're me. You just have to, you know, tell a little white lie and tell them, you know, um, I'm such and such, and here's the app on my phone, and I need to park in my spot. And I'm thinking, man, this just does not feel comfortable. And, uh, and I'm kind of thinking, like, but it's kind of worth it because it's $180, and I look over at him, and he goes, bro, we have come way too far in life to lie over a parking spot. 
It's those little moments of darkness that tempt you, right? That lure you and that have the temptation to numb you to the light. It's far, for me, it's far more those situations than it is the glaring lies, the, the glaring darkness. So what would it mean? So for me, it meant to listen to my buddy that day and say, yeah, you know what? We're not letting darkness into this. Who cares what will happen? You know, we're going we're gonna to live by the truth. We're going to walk in the light. So let me tell you, let's, let's, let's let the tape play out a little bit more. Let's look at this great threat of an Advent life, lifestyle. And I, I really think that it's this. It's a suppression of the truth. It is, um, it is suppressing the truth. Um, next weekend, something cool is going to happen uh, for people that live in Antarctica anyway. Um, just nobody. There's a solar eclipse that's happening next week, right? I think we might be able to see a little bit of it, but uh, it's going to be best in Antarctica, so get your tickets. Uh, a solar eclipse, you know, I'm not a science teacher, but a solar eclipse, I'm, I think, the way that I understand it is, you know, the sun, the sun shines, right? It's always shining. I think a solar eclipse is what happens when the moon um, comes in between uh, us and, and, the, uh, and the sun, and then the shadow that's cast over the, uh, from the moon covers, covers at least a part of the earth, right? So when you, when you think about it, you know, you think about this giant shadow that covers the earth. And as you think about an, a solar eclipse, um, you think about the, really the makeup of the sun. For us, it seems like the sun is gone, but the sun isn't gone. The sun isn't destroyed. I mean, it still burns with all of its fierce intensity. It's, you know, hydrogen and helium makeup, the big ball of fire that it is, this giant star. It, its brightness, it, it hasn't been extinguished. No, it's just been hidden from our sight. The shadow that the eclipse will cast on the earth doesn't change the essence of the light. It doesn't change the truth. It just obscures it, right? Friends, as we think about the truth of God's word, I want you to think about light. If we buy into the world's ways, which are to address the issues of our fallen condition without the gospel of Christ, and with the ways and the solutions of this world, the same shadow will fall on us. The same shadow that fell on the church 500 years ago can fall on this church. And it, and it starts by falling on each of our hearts, right? When we suppress the truth, when the darkness overcomes our hearts. The truth, which is the light of Christ, is supposed to be set on a lampstand, something that we're proud of, something... That gives, that gives meaning to all of our life. This is why Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount. Listen to what he says in Matthew chapter five. He says, he says these disciples, he's like, the, like one of the first things that he says to them after the Beatitudes is this, you are the light of the world. He, he draws out that identity statement that Paul mentions, right? You, you're light. You are children of the light. Your, your most basic identity is that you belong to the light. That's it. As Christians, that's us. And he says, a city, he gives us, Jesus was great at painting these pictures, right? A city set on a hill can't be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine. Let your identity in Christ escape your homes, escape, let it, let it seep out into the world, he says, so that they may see your good works and not give glory to you, but give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Friends, the only way that the world is ultimately changed is by the force of the gospel light of Jesus Christ covering the face of the earth. And, and, and the, the way that God is pleased to do this is he's pleased to use my heart and your heart as the conduits of the gospel of light going out into the world. So what are the mechanics? Let's go, let's, so that's God's design, but that's not often our experience. What are the mechanics of a darkened heart? How does that come to be? How does that happen? How does that happen in my heart and in your heart? Well, the Bible calls it a suppression of truth. 
Suppression means to, to hold something back, to hide something, to, to hide namely the truth, to, to dis, disassemble the truth, to, to water down the truth, to suppress the truth, to push down the truth of who God is, what he sent Jesus into the world to do, and what it means for us to embrace the lifestyle of Advent. Because the, the gospel is the good news of what Jesus has done. It is. But it's also the good news of what God wants to do in and through your life. The, the church tends to vacillate historically through those two things. It's like all grace or all works, right? But the truth is the gospel is really something in the middle that grace leads you to live a certain way. After all, Jesus doesn't say, let the world see, you know, what you declare your faith to be. He says, let your good works shine in the world, doesn't he? Those are the demands of the gospel. And church, it might be more costly now than ever to let your light shine. There is a temptation right now to suppress the truth and to try to say the right things to appease the people that are around us. That's not what it means to put your lamp on a stand. It means that we are not ashamed of the gospel, which is the verse that actually comes right before we're looking at Romans 1 here. Um, so this, this warning, this is a warning for us, okay? It's, sometimes it's hard to hear warnings, but it's better to hear warnings than to not hear them, right? Um, when Jesus came into the world, he came into a world that was already under judgment. He didn't, he didn't offer anything that the world didn't already feel. Um, and when Jesus came into the world, there was, there was no one that belonged in fellowship with his father. In light of this, um, I want you to hear what Paul says to those who desire to really edit the truth of God's word. I mean, can you imagine this? I mean, to, when we don't take God's word uh, at face value as God's word, typically, I mean, what we're really saying is this. You, we hear God's word and we're like, hold on, um, let me get my highlighter out. Let me get my red pen. I'm going to actually just edit that a little bit and kind of cut out this and move it over here and maybe put this over there. When we don't take God's word at face value as, as really the light for our lives, that's what we're doing. We're taking out our red pen to God's word. And so Paul says there's a warning. There's, he gives us a warning uh, for our temptation to do that. He says this, verse 18 in, in Romans chapter one, he says this, for the, for the wrath of God is revealed. That's a word we don't like, Right? <laughs> The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, by their unrighteousness, the way that they live their lives, in other words, suppress the truth. They muzzle the truth. They put it under a basket. They edit the truth. For what can be known about God is plain, Paul says, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, they've been clearly perceived by everyone on the face of the planet, he says. Ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. That's a, this, this is the textbook place for this theological term called general revelation, which basically means this. God has revealed himself to us. We know who God is just because we are image bearers of him and we live in this world. We know who God is. He says, so we have to do something when we know who God is and we discover who we are in our sin. We have to come into the light, right? This is why Jesus came. But he's to, Paul is writing to a church who said they came into the light but didn't fully come into the light, didn't really embrace it. Listen to what he says is happening. He says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. The shadow came over their hearts. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And what happened is they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. They worshiped other things. And then here's the scariest verse, one of the scariest verses in the whole Bible. Therefore, God gave them up. We don't like to believe that God is a God that can just give us up to our simple desires, do we? That, that's part we want to edit. We want to edit that out, that his love would overcome his justice, right? He says, therefore, God gave them up in their lust and their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie 
and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. The suppression of truth is the foundational sin of all of humanity. The truth is this, is that you and I and every other person on the face of the planet are under the wrath of God if we are not covered by the blood of Christ. And when we choose volition and we choose and his spirit awakens our hearts and we choose Jesus, the, the desire of Jesus, really the will of God is for that light to permeate all that we are. We have no light in and of ourselves. The world is trying to convince you in every single way that you have light. You're not as bad as you, as you feel like you are. And I, I just want to tell you the truth. You are that bad. You really are. But that's not the end of your story. That's not it. Because Christ has come to make us children of the light. We might not look like we are under judgment in this world because we seem to be flourishing. We might not feel like we were under judgment. But Jesus promises that the works of darkness will ultimately be revealed, and this statement will prove to be true in our lives if we do not embrace the fullness of his light. In this church in Rome, there were believers who knew God. Think about this. They had a personal relationship with God. Jesus was their personal Lord and Savior, right? But they did not honor him they did not, because they did not believe his word and his word was not changing their lives functionally. And by the way, I just want to say this. You know who else has a personal relationship with Jesus? Satan. <laughs> he's, got, he's, he's the first one to have a personal relationship with Jesus, right? It's, it's so personal that there will never be a moment in his life that he will not be reminded of the wrath of God against sin. And he, unlike us, did not have the opportunity to repent. You see, Jesus has this right in his perfect justice where he can give us up to the lust of our hearts. And that's scary because we, we know what's capable in our hearts, what we're capable of. But I want you to take comfort today, church, that the role of the Holy Spirit in your life is to keep you in the light. It's to keep you in the light. It's to keep fanning the flame of the truth that you've heard when you've heard the gospel. But volitionally, we must choose to stay in the light, right? This is what it means to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. He gives us the power, but we have to choose to be children of the light and to stay in that light so that we can avoid, you know, these eclipses over our own hearts. And I know I just said that. You guys are going to Bonnie Tyler. I know, it's all right. Did that go over your head? Total eclipse of the heart, come on. <laughs> Greatest song of the 80s. Anyway, um, Turn around. <laughs> Isaiah 50, um, Isaiah would write this that, that really talks about this, um, this temptation that we have when it comes to like editing God's truth and, uh, and not living in the fullness of its light, not embracing the light of the gospel um, the way that he's designed for us to. He says this, and it's, it's kind of, it kind of goes on with this warning. Isaiah 50, verses 10 through 11, he says, Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. In other words, your lostness is not a problem to God. He, is, he stands ready and able, mighty to save, ready to rescue you. But, he's, but he, he kind of gives this warning for those who don't really realize that they're lost. Like relying on God is not a problem. You know, in fact, it is, it, is, it, is the basic under, it is the basic position of, a, of the heart of a Christian, is that you are desperate for God's grace. But he says there's this other way to live, right? He says, behold, all you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with torches. In other words, you try to, you try to find your own light through how you live. He says, walk by the light of your fire and by the torches that you have kindled. This you have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. In other words, that light is not going to lead you to life. And all of us have that temptation. So there's really two ways to live, Isaiah says, is to admit that in and of ourselves we have no light, that we have no truth, that we have no revelation, that we have no hope, that we have no purpose in life. And therefore, we must rely solely on God to be our light. It sounds pitiful, right? It sounds like who would ever want that? That's what the world thinks. 
You're so weak. Christians are weak. Yeah, here we are. Yeah, Christ is our strength. It's great, right? It's sad. You have to be so strong, right? It's, your weakness is not a problem to God, church. It is the way that we express our desperation to him. Paul said that, 2 Corinthians 12. The second way to live is to kindle our own fires with this truth-suppressing lumber, right? This, uh, and to equip ourselves with this edited word of God and to exchange it for man-made ways. Isaiah warns us that we will ultimately have to walk by the light of those fires, and it will not lead us to life. As we kind of land the plane on this point right here, I just my question to you is this. Is there a place in your life right now where, um, where you've taken the provision of the gospel um, or the commands that flow from the gospel on our lives, the lifestyle that flows it, flows from it, and edit it for your own needs? Um, I know it might not seem like much, but the scriptures say that our hearts slowly and surely become darkened as we do this. Our hearts become hardened toward God's word. And maybe you've given just a little into the flesh recently, and um, maybe you've embraced a worldview that has man at the center, not Jesus at the center. Or maybe you've got some kind of lifestyle sin that really isn't in alignment with Christ, and you just kind of tucked it away in the darkness and, and thought, you know, hey, that's, that's never, I'm never really going to be found out with that. It's not really a problem. The scriptures tell us that's a dangerous place to live because we're suppressing the truth, that nothing in your life that is hidden now will not be made fully known to God. And he's really the only one that it matters to, right, for us. So I just want, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to enter into this, this text without just asking the question. Is there a place in your life where you've kind of edited God's word to suit your own needs? And have you considered the danger that that might be, the harm that it might be um, to your heart? What would it look like for you to come into the light with that? The third thing we're going to talk about today is this, is that there's this great hope of an Advent lifestyle. Uh, and I, th I really think that it is a providential comfort that we experience through Christ's rule and reign. That he, that he has set up his kingdom in such a way to care for our every need. If we will let all of our lives hang on, on him, dependence on him. The, the rule and reign of King Jesus' dominion is, um, in essence, a spiritual domain. Um, and I think, you know, at, at this point in redemption it is. In, in Abraham's time, it did involve a lot of physical things, physical land, right? Um, but for us, it is this spiritual domain that shows up in physical places. But the, the, the primary place of Jesus' rule and reign is on the hearts of humanity right now, right? This is what Jesus is after. His, his kingdom is spiritual in nature at this juncture. When Jesus returns, it will, it will be coupled with this physical kingdom. So for us to be transformed into the image of Jesus doesn't mean that we all physically look like Jesus. That'd be kind of weird, right? Um, and I guarantee you he doesn't look like that white guy with blue eyes, okay? I'm just gonna, just gonna throw that out there, right? <laughs> wow, okay. Anyway, um, that wasn't in the notes. Um, but it means that our spirit is being shaped to the spirit of Christ. This is what sanctification really is for us, uh, of how he, how he loved and how he lived and and in the flesh, the world, and the devil, like we talked about last week in temptation, all seek to stand against that. So the primary place his spirit transforms us is, is spiritually, he transforms our spirit. Um, has, you know, has, your, has your flesh been tempted recently uh, to, to, to come out from uh, a, a, a lifestyle of Advent? Like, I mean, I shared my story with you earlier. Are you aware of the, the temptations that you have to, to kind of come outside of that lifestyle of Advent? I, 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 another story that's just funny that's coming to mind, sorry, Megan, um, is uh, Megan, Megan was driving our minivan, this is years ago, and, uh, and she, hit a, she clipped a mailbox with her mirror, okay? And so the, the, the mailbox like, it like was damaged, right? And she was on the way to her friend's house, and she, she called her friend kind of in a panic, and she said, she said, hey, Zoe, what should I do? And then her, her friend had the greatest response. She goes, what do you want to do? It was great. So what do you want to do? And she's like, of course, I want to leave. I want to leave the scene. I want to run. And, and so anyway, she decided in that moment 
that, that she would just write a little note, and if something came of it, she would fix it. But the problem was the only piece of paper that she had in the car was my church business card. <laughs> so she leaves it on the door. This, this lifestyle of light, uh, this, this theology of light, this salvation of light, is, is a, it's a gospel with legs on it, church. And I don't want you to forget that. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 5 about this, this identity as light. He says, for at one time you were darkness. So that's all of our stories. At one time, like in our essence, we were dark. We were darkness. Um, but now, he says, you are light in this world. Therefore, walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Verse 13 says this, But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. So our identity, church, as Christians, through the work of Christ, has been changed. And we have this lifestyle of light that accompanies it. And, and the mission of the church is to expose the work of darkness in our own lives as we share community together, but also in the world. The essence of walking as light is to carry light into dark places. And this is really what kind of the remainder of the series is going to explore. But, but before this text gets away from us, I want, I want to read this last verse to you again, because it's really critical for us. When anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Okay, that's cool. That's good, right? But listen to this. For anything that becomes visible is light. Think about this. Any dark deed that is brought out of the darkness and made visible becomes light. The devil wants to conform you to the image of darkness. He wants to shape your life in the darkness of this world, in the darkness of sin and shame, but Jesus conforms us to the image of light. He destroys the plans. Think about it this way. The plans of the enemy are destroyed every time you confess your sin. Because what you're doing is you're taking that thing that was in the darkness, you're bringing it into the light, and you're saying, God, use this to change me. And because we're willing to do that, what God does, is, and there's these great promises in the Bible, right? Romans 8, 28, um, for God works all things, okay? Even that thing you brought out of the darkness and you set into the light that's really terrible. He uses all things to conform us to the image uh, of Jesus, to, 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 to change us. He, uses, he works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Even the sin that you confess becomes light. Do you see how that works? That's the last thing that you believe when you fall into sin, though, isn't it? It's like if anybody ever finds this out about me, I'm gonna be, my life is gonna be miserable. That is a lie, church, from the pit of hell. God takes the dark things, and when we confess them, when we bring them into the light, he uses them to, to finish his work in us. The light of the gospel for us has legs. And I wanna, I wanna close by, by bookending this, by reading Isaiah 9, and just showing you the sovereign care and comfort of the Lord. Listen to Isaiah 9. I'm gonna read just verses six and seven as we close here. And uh, my hope is that um, as, we, as we hear this and we think about this sermon today, that Advent would be a lifestyle for the church, that it would be a lifestyle for you and for me. Um, so listen to what Jesus would come to do. Isaiah says this, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. His name shall be called Mighty God. His name shall be called Everlasting Father. His name shall be called the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. What our hearts so desperately long for. The nature of this light bringing king church 
that has brought light into our dark world is that the government shall be upon his shoulders. Now, when you think about government, don't let our American idea of government define what the scriptures mean by this. He's come to rule the world through the transformation of human hearts. He's come to make his dominion and his domain on your heart and on my heart and on this church. And he's come to do it really in, in, in a few ways. He says he's a wonderful counselor. Jesus is all wise. In other words, there's no better wisdom in this world to be found other than through him. This is why Romans 8 says, when you pray and you don't know what to pray, you're praying with these groanings that are too deep from words, he hears you. And that is enough because he is all wise. You don't have to have the right words. He is a mighty God. Jesus possesses all strength. He came in weakness at his first advent, but church, when he returns at his second, he will not be weak. He will be strong, will be the strength of the nations. He is an everlasting father. This one surprises me so much because Jesus is all caring like an everlasting father. He's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters, but he also serves as this type of father to us. As John 14, he says, Jesus says, hey, I know it's gonna be lonely. You're gonna be, you're gonna be scared and isolated, but I'm not gonna leave you as orphans was the promise. He's a kind, compassionate, caring, good, good father to us. And lastly, he's the prince of peace. Jesus will bring Shalom. Jesus is bringing shalom, this perfect peace, not just the appearance of peace, but the essence of it in and, in and of his being. This church is the king that we've waited for. And as we journey on through this season, my prayer is that Advent would become a way of life for us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you uh, that you are all wise that you are all powerful, that you are all caring, and that you care, you give us everything that we need, Lord. Oh, there is such a temptation to muzzle the truth of your word today, Lord. We need you to speak to us through your word, Lord. We need this word to be etched on our hearts, Lord. We need to walk in the light. So, Lord, today as we think about our lives would you help us come into alignment with your word, Lord? Father, as we turn to this table today, Father, I ask um, that the darkness of our hearts would be exposed and that would be really, really good news. So Lord, um, we pray that you'd meet with us and that we would experience your presence, Lord, as an all-wise, all-powerful, all-peaceful, all-caring God exactly what we need this morning, Lord. So we thank you that Jesus is that. We pray that in his name. Amen. Hey, Pastor Ryan here. We're so glad that you've tuned in with us and watched one of our online sermons. Our vision as a church is to live as the family of God together, proclaiming and demonstrating the gospel of grace to one another in our city. If you don't have a church home or you're looking for a church, we'd invite you to attend one of our in-person worship gatherings so you can experience all that God has for us as a community of believers on mission.